This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. The Bank of Japan shocks global markets. It loosens its grip on bond yields. The yen whipsaws and Kazuo Ueda's first surprise since taking the helm. Intel jumps. The chipmaker declares an end to the PC slump and says the second half will show that its long-awaited comeback is underway. Plus, Hermes surprises its rivals thanks to strong demand for its Birkin bag, while Karen scoops up a stake in Valentino as growth sputters at its biggest brand, Gucci. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Kriti, I wanted on the record that last week and the start of this week, I said that the Bank of Japan would be the most exciting meeting. And it did not disappoint. It loosens the cap on yields, and Japan thus becomes the land of the rising yields. And that is fair. I, I got to say to our global audience last week, I want to say like maybe early last week, we were planning for this week. And Danny said, if we don't hit this hard, we're going to be in big trouble. So kudos <laughs> to you, Danny, because, hey, you were right. And you can really see that in the market action here. Look, there's some mixed cross currents because we are still dealing with earnings season stateside as well. And that is going to be crucial simply when we talk about what we're seeing. Remember, S&P 500 futures are higher today, but real app performance coming from NASDAQ futures higher by six tenths of one percent. But I don't think you can really tie that to the Japanese monetary policy. Go to the bond market, though, a completely different story. The 10-year yield coming up against that 4% level it is a massive move in yesterday's session that we saw. Now virtually unchanged right now as you're starting to see the market kind of balance itself out. But seeing a 10-year yield at 4% when it was kind of on its way down, a lot of the market pricing and cuts really speaks that bond volatility coming from abroad as opposed to from right here at home. And of course, that 10-year yield, Danny, that's what you were talking about, breaking above that 50 basis point band. We are now at about 56. We'll 57 basis points on that 10 year yield uh, and still higher by the way higher overnight by about 12 basis points that's really where you're seeing all of the action I think reading into the European session a bit more we'll throw that to you in just a second dollar yen worth getting a check here because you are seeing strength in the Japanese yen following the yield story 139.70 on that currency pair but again the FX story is limited relative to the bond movements you're seeing this morning and that is the brilliance of what Ueda has done, Kriti, that he essentially has given Japan a path, it would seem, out of yield curve control. But he hasn't officially changed anything, and the market isn't reacting in a big way. It does seem like an elegant solution to a bind that Japan currently finds itself in. You can see that in what euro versus the yen doing, which really has been the most important cross. Yesterday, the euro declined some 2% versus the yen, its biggest move since SVB collapsed. It was twofold for Europe. It was actually threefold. It was a slightly dovish tilt from the ECB. It was hot data coming out from the U.S. And then you had this announcement from the Nikkei hinting that the BOJ would do what they would do today. But again, we're barely getting any movement today. And that says something. The euro, though, versus the dollar, that continues to fall. We're under 110. It's currently down by about two-tenths of 1%. German 10-year yields, those are moving higher by about five bips. We are continuing to see a sell-off in Europe, but that really is in reaction to yesterday's session in the U.S. The bulk of the price move in the U.S. when we hit 4%, Europe was closed. So we have to play a little bit of catch-up for the yield story. And European stocks, Kriti, as you said, I mean, a million cross currents out there right now. This is partially in reaction to all the other FX stuff, to the yield stuff, but also to earnings too. Yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff to go through for sure. Uh, more now on that BOJ surprise. Though Governor Ueda spoke earlier about what was going on at his news conference. Take a listen. <laughs> I want to stress that the decision today to tweak the YCC is not a step towards normalization. The aim is to enhance the sustainability of the monetary easing. Well, of course, this has global ramifications, so we bring in a global roundtable. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Valerie Titel and Eddie Vanderwalt from Bloomberg's M Live team. Valerie, let's start with you here. Confusing market reaction, specifically when you look at what the bond market is doing versus what the FX market is doing. Let's start with the basics. What does this new YCC band actually look like? 
Look, Kriti, again, that's one of the confusing things because officially the band's target hasn't moved. It is still at 50 basis points. What has changed is their implementation of how they impend on defending the band. They are going to use flexibility when they take action between half a basis point and 1%. The other key question then after that is how much intervening does the Bank of Japan intend to do? How much bond buying do they intend to do? Even Ueda said himself he is unsure. So really, it's maybe all down to where U.S. yields go. If we get more hot data out of the U.S., if global yields keep headed higher, followed by treasuries, if then JGBs do follow that global uh, yields higher, we then will then we'll, it's not only and then then we find out how much the Bank of Japan really intends to slow down this volatility, slow down this yield creep as that JGBs maybe may, or maybe not head towards one percent sometime soon. Yeah, it's the smoothing move up, upward, and it does seem, though, like it's a step towards normalization value. It's how everyone has been treating it. Ueda specifically saying this is not a step towards normalization, but the bond market has been functioning. That's the reason they used last time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, why would they do it now? Yeah, this time around, his excuse, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't say excuse. It's too big <laughs> of a word. His reasoning, shall I say, was to enhance the, st the sustainability of monetary easing under the current framework by conducting this yield curve control with greater flexibility. And he used this word many times in his mm -hmm. press conference. They want to be nimble. He wants to be able to nimbly respond Respond to both upside and downside risk when it comes to J Japan's economic activity and inflation prices. That was the key quote, the key change uh, to the statement, which allowed them to uh, maybe uh, uh, pitch forward this flexibility in between a half a basis point uh, and 1%. But look, I'm not sure how much the market is going to buy it. And I think it honestly is too soon to tell. It's yes. way too soon to tell the implementation, this, this, uh, the, uh, the effect this is going to have on global markets. Yes, JGB yields only rose uh, 10 basis points. Some of that a big of a shock, but you look over to how the Treasury market is behaving, yields are holding in quite well. See, this is the thing. You say you don't know if markets will buy it, but Eddie, let me bring you into the conversation because the market seems to be buying it. I mean, yeah. we are having very orderly moves right now. Y yeah, absolutely. I think, I think uh, you know, if people worry or people said this early this morning that maybe there was a bit of miscommunication, maybe the market didn't know what to expect. I think Ueda pulled off exactly what he wanted to do, which was to loosen the cap without causing, a, you know, massive fallout. Because if, if, if we did see those uh, long-end yields in Japan shoot up, which is what normally happens when you remove a cap, you do see, you know, you see a pop up to the the next level and if we had that it would have reverberated across bond markets everywhere because you know Japan is the second biggest bond market in the world and they you know so, so if, if, if we see 10-year yields suddenly spiking higher you treat the world bond market as a, as a finite pool you see investors coming out of investments in the US and elsewhere and putting their money in into Japan bonds instead that will have yield curve effects across the board now we are seeing some of that steepening um, you know across the world but it would have been much more pronounced if it was much more clearer communication from the from the Bank of Japan and therefore I think they, they pulled off quite a neat trick here <laughs> Well, Eddie, let me follow on that there. You're talking about these global ramifications. At the end of the day, Japan is not only uh, one of the second, one of the largest credit markets in the world, it's also the largest holder of U.S. treasuries. Talk to us a little bit about what you see for, say, U.S. demand or when it comes to U.S. bonds broadly in light of the fact that there's this massive move in Japanese markets. Yeah, that's exactly it, right? You are, you, you are looking at, you know, we, we shouldn't think, of course, there are, there are Japanese bonds and there are U.S. bonds, but you should think of the global bond market as one giant market with a finite number of investors that have a duration preference, many of them, and, and will want to see, you know, they, they, they want to be in, in, the, in the safest government bonds where the best yields are. And at the moment, that's in the U.S. Now, if you see that dynamic shift and you see... Uh, Japan ha having less yield control, less uh, downward pressure on, on, on their 10-year yields, that is going to impact yields across the board. You will see a steepening of yield curves and you will see higher yields everywhere. So I think this is an important first step. I don't think this is the end game. I think, you know, Japan obviously have a, you know, J Japanese yields has a lot further to go. And that will, will, will obviously move towards that uh, re-steepening of the yield curve, the uninversion of the yield curve. And, you know, which, which might just be what the world economy needs at this stage uh, to, to, to see that inversion or uninversion without causing uh, a recession, as many fear.
And, and this is the key. If, if Japan moves, how do they do it smoothly? So it's, again, maybe things change, but not in a way to really disrupt global markets. Of course, Europe also, uh, that bond market largely he held by Japanese investors. On this front, I want to bring us some breaking lines that crossed just a few moments ago. We had Euro area economic confidence coming in for the month of July. 94 and a half. The estimate was 95, a slight miss, but also some lines from the ECB's Casimir. Val, I want to read these to you and get your thoughts. He said a September pause wouldn't mean no hikes after that. The last hike brought us within the reach of the peak. We should take firm steps further on the way to the top. Our mission is still not fulfilled. After a slight dovish tilt from Lagarde yesterday. This feels like a tilt back into the hawkish direction. Look, I think this is all about the ECB slightly changing their language. Instead of uh, pre, um, pre guaranteeing hikes, they're now going to just tell us that they're data dependent and try to keep their options as open as possible. Really kind of follow the language of the Fed. Lagarde has stolen many of Powell's lines in the last year. <laughs> but but the, to me, this just looks like they want to see, they want to have as much optionality as possible. They're done giving forward guidance and they're now going to be telling us they are data dependent. I'll leave us all with this. Kazuo Ueda literally invented the concept of forward guidance. And if he's ditched it, <laughs> then Lagarde and Powell can ditch it. Eddie, Valerie, thank you so much for joining us. That's Eddie Vandervault and Valerie Titel. Now, later this hour, we're going to get more analysis on the BOJ decision with the man that you want to hear from. It's Sock Gen strategist Kit Jukes. Plus, a PC recovery is helping Intel boost its outlook. We're going to take a closer look with William DeGale, Blue Box Asset Management Lead Portfolio Manager. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Luxury earnings are in focus. We've had a lot of them. Gucci owner Caring struggled to keep up with its rivals when it reported yesterday. We also had Hermes, some strong numbers. Joining us now is Bloomberg Intelligence's senior industry analyst for the luxury sector, Deborah, Deborah Atkins. Deborah, let's start with Caring. It's the first one we got yesterday. Um, What's going on there? Because there's been a lot happening with Gucci. What was your takeaway from the earnings? So um, overall, I think Gucci was a little bit disappointing versus what was expected. But the uh, expectation going in wasn't strong at all. Um, they're still very much amid an elongated, uh, uh, lengthened. It's not showing any improvement versus uh, Q1. And in fact, actually, despite some of the headlines, it's actually a little bit worse than it was in, in one Q for, uh, for, for Gucci. Um, it's about reinvigorating the brand, elevating that luxury appeal. And we know that there's been a huge shakeup uh, with management, so that clearly wasn't on track with the board and with top management. That's to be addressed. Mm. And Deborah, some potential deal news on our hands as well. Caring, potentially looking for a 30% stake in Valentino. How does this deal work? What does Valentino bring to the table besides, I gotta admit, fabulous shoes? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really uh, solid fit for the company. Um, growing so well, uh, a good price, so 1.7 billion, that buys them 30% with the option uh, to buy in fully before the end of 2028. And we think that would very much be on the cards for them. They certainly have the cash available, very strong balance sheet to be able to do those types of deals. It's about brand elevation and creating um, the couture side of the business, so then really moving up. And that should also help them with the understanding of Gucci. So I think there's so much to play for with that brand. And they've, they're really riding this uh, Barbie core wave too. Valentino was one of the first of them to have too much pink. I'm, I'm over the pink, unfortunately, Deborah. So let me move <laughs> on to something pink. different. <laughs> Hermes, very strong. Again, at the upper echelon of luxury, that continues to outperform. The Birkin bag, everyone still wants one. What was your takeaway? Do you know, the big thing here, actually, um, so 28% growth on that Q2, which is an acceleration from Q1. No slowdown whatsoever, uh, doing ever so well across the whole of the Americas, including into 2Q but also how wide uh, ranging and how strong they were by all region and all category. But just on that Birkin bag, um, actually ready to wear, which is seen as more of a discretionary spend because you can't really wear it so often, not carry it around as much as, you, as often as you could a bag. 
is up in the 30s in terms of percentage of growth, so doing ever so well. Also, fashion accessories, watches, uh, so strong, and leather doing, doing well too. Huh. So a, a lot of different elements. It's not, it's not just the Birkin. Deborah, thank you very much. That is Deborah Aiken of Bloomberg Intelligence. From luxury to tech now, Intel surging in the pre-market session after the chip maker reported a surprising profit in the second quarter. It also gave a bullish sales forecast. Let's bring in Bloomberg Intelligence analyst Matt Bloxham. Matt, what's going on here? Because I thought PC was still supposed to be slumping. I guess it's not. Yeah, I mean, I think we heard similar messages from Intel yesterday from what we've heard from other chip manufacturers earlier this week that we possibly passed the bottom of the PC uh, market sometime in Q2. As, as you said, like $12.9 billion of sales, that was a 7% beat versus consensus for, for Q2 and an optimistic Q3 forecast, um, which could be as much as 5% ahead of estimates. Now, most of that is coming from... PC demand that probably bottomed and some strength coming back into it. So inventory levels are normalizing. Um, and so they're, they're optimistic they're going to continue to see demand for PC um, chips in the second half. Now, uh, the, there's kind of a big turnaround story going at Intel. Uh, and I think this is kind of helping people to get more comfortable that they're on the right track. But there's still a lot of question marks about how the AI opportunity plays out for them. Well, speaking of that AI opportunity, Matt, when you look at some of the other chip makers around the world, Samsung, for example, uh, we've, of course, looked at NVIDIA, AMD. There are definitely certain companies that are more positioned to really capitalize on the opportunity. Where does Intel fall in that spectrum? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a kind of indirect opportunity for Intel, and they kind of alluded to this um, yesterday. I mean, they, you know, they kind of losing out on the server market. I think what they're saying is that you're going to need a lot more PC processing power going forward to uh, operate some of these AI apps. And so indirectly, there'll be more PC demand over the midterm. Uh, you need their chips for PCs, and that's where the big opportunity will come for them. They're trying to play in the server market too, uh, but I think they're going to struggle there because there are other players uh, that have a stronger offering there. What have we learned about pricing and pricing power of these chip makers this earnings season, Matt? Um, I don't think anything new compared to what we've seen in, in uh, historical cycles. You know, it's, there's a supply-demand balance you have to get right. You, you kind of build uh, these foundries with huge amounts of capacity. Uh, and if, you know, the demand isn't there, ultimately you end up with XX supply. Uh, and that kind of squeezes pricing. So, you know, it's, it's playing out the balance of how much supply you bring online when so that you're not kind of creating a glut. Um, that, that pressures the whole industry. So, you know, tricky balance, but this is the same cycle that these chip manufacturers have been playing, you know, for years and years and years. Okay, Matt, thank you very much for joining us. That's Matt Bloxham of Bloomberg Intelligence. And later today, Intel CEO Pat Genslinger will be joining the Bloomberg Tech team. That's at 12 p.m. New York time. First, though, coming up here, Ford holds back on its plans to ramp up EV production. It blames the latest price war in the industry. We'll have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Shares of Ford are falling in the pre-market after the automaker said it's delaying plans to increase EV production. Ford blames the delay on the price war for battery-powered vehicles. CEO Jim Farley told analysts on a conference call, quote, clearly this transition to EVs is dynamic. The pricing pressure has dramatically increased in just the last 60 days. Creedy, I know this is a story you watch closely. I'm just reminded of Elon Musk when he first started cutting the cost of Tesla, said, no, we're not going to start a pricing war. That's not what they're doing. But clearly they have, and clearly they're nudging some competitors out of the market. Yeah, and I mean, look, it's a strategy that's working. But look, this was also something that was addressed in the Chinese market. Remember when Tesla signed on with some of the mm. other EV makers in China saying, look, we are not going to engage in a price war to ex eliminate this exact dynamic. I wonder to what extent you start to see the car market and start to need some sort of say or, or thinking from Washington here when, of course, things work mm. a little bit differently stateside. That's true. Uh, interesting. So regulation? 
coming into the fore? I mean, maybe, maybe right? Like if, if it is if it is about prices, I mean, you and I have talked uh, a lot to different regulators about sort of ramping up on, on some of these things, Critty. Um, but you and I, of course, also talked to Stellantis. An interesting story there is that Stellantis is teaming with GM and others to build more charging networks in the U.S. So if other car makers are doubling down, Ford is therefore bucking the trend. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think when you're talking about, again, that interesting uh, kind of weighing in from Washington as well, also consider just how much this is costing a lot of Ford. They haven't been able to scale up in the way that I think they were really mm. anticipating to at a time when they're not able to sell their regular gas diesel cars. Yeah, yeah. I still love the idea of an electric F-150. I think I think that's so silly. I mean, in a great way, in a great way, to be clear. All right, Critty, I want to take us through some of the other movers that are happening in Europe this morning because we've got a lot of earnings that we haven't had the chance to talk about. So Standard Charter, the bank, they've announced a $1 billion buyback. Their earnings beat all about higher interest rates. They think it will continue. And then it's a tale of two different airlines. IAG, the parent company of British Airways, an airline Critty will soon know very well, and Air France, KLM, both of them had record profits. However, only one of them is up, just IIG, and that's because Air France and KLM have an issue with costs. Not just that, but also there's some concern about a dimmer capacity outlook. There's some jet delays that Air France KLM are dealing with. All right, coming up, we're going to get back to the BOJ story and the end. We're going to talk to Kit Juke Sokjen, global head of FX Strategy. Next, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. The Bank of Japan shocks global markets by loosening its grip on bond yields. The yen whipsaws in Kazuo Ueda's first surprise move since taking the helm. And Intel jumps. The chip maker declares an end to the PC slump and says the second half will show that its long-awaited comeback is finally underway. Plus, Hermes surpasses its rivals thanks to strong demand for its Birkin bag while carrying soups up a stake in Valentino as growth sputters at its biggest brand, Gucci. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Danny, there is actually a lot of corporate news out there in the markets. We are dead in the middle of a lot of these earning stories on both sides of the Atlantic. But I got to say, the BOJ, it takes the cake. Yeah, I was going to say, I know this is really bad to say, Kriti, but kind of the BOJ is all I care about, not kind of. It is the only thing I care about. But there are other important moves happening out there, so kind of ignore that I just said that. Erase it from your memory. However, the really interesting thing, though, is that the BOJ policy officially, it hasn't changed. They still want yields at 0%. The band is still within 50 basis points. Just the way that enforce that is changing with that flexibility up to 1%. And the remarkable thing about it is the moves are quite muted. Yesterday, the euro versus the yen dropped by about 2%. I'll get more into that in just a moment. We're going to talk to Kit Jukes very shortly. But this morning, the moves are not that remarkable. We're basically flat in the euro versus the yen. The euro is indeed weaker versus the dollar, uh, weaker by about one-tenth of 1%. One a lot going on there between hot U.S. data a maybe more dovish ECB data that doesn't look good in Europe. And then, of course, the BOJ played into that yesterday, too. Germany, 10-year yields, they are moving higher. We are seeing a sell-off in the global bond market. But this is more acute than what we're seeing in the U.S., just because Europe has to play catch-up with what happened in the U.S. session overnight for us here in Europe. And here's the earnings story, Critty. I do care. It's the Stocks Europe 600, down by about three-tenths of 1%. A lot of variation on earnings. For example, Air France KLM, that's falling today, dragging down the sector, Critty. Yeah, a, a divergence from what you're seeing stateside here, Danny, because on the earnings here, you've actually seen a lot of positive numbers. Even though Ford is talking about this pullback in, in EVs, they still beat on their profit, for example. Intel is soaring this morning, pushing futures higher by about four-tenths of 1%. If you look at the NASDAQ, the tech-heavy index, those futures outperforming even more. But I think the real story, to your point, Danny, uh, even though I can hear a lot of those corporate companies coming for you to say it's the only story that matters, <laughs> the BOJ is really influencing the bond market. Ten-year yield on the U.S., just shy of 4 399 we'll call it a massive move in yesterday's session that isn't really having a translation into today's how much movement did uh, the BOJ really add to the U.S. story and that's going to be an important question when we talk about hedging with Kit Jukes again you mentioned in just a moment Japanese 10-year yield is crucial remember crossing above that 50 basis point ban look that policy is still in place someone tell the bond market 57 basis points there on that yield already higher by 12 basis points overnight massive move something that's not necessarily translating to that much of an 
extent in the FX space. Dollar yen just shy of 140, 139.58. We'll call it virtually unchanged, but you can really see that Japanese strength following those interest rate differentials. Uh, we're going to dive into that, Danny, uh, just shortly. Yeah, I, I actually want to dive into it now, Critty, because the most fascinating FX pair yesterday was Euro Yen. Let me show you what it looks like over the two day, because first, the yen was hit by an ECB decision, only slightly, though, I should say. We were kind of trying to see if we could read some of the dovish tea leaves. And then you got U.S. data, which sent the euro lower. And then you had that release from the Nikkei saying that the BOJ was considering tweaks to YCC. So you get it cratering yesterday. It dropped by more than 2%, the biggest drop since SVB collapsed. But if you look at today's session, you can see some of the wobbles around the BOJ announcement that 1% is the hard land they're going to draw on the sand for yields. Even so, just on the day, we're pretty much unchanged from where we started. Let's now bring in Kit Juke, Sock, Sock Gen head of FX strategy. Kit, really wonderful to have you on. A lot to cover, perhaps too much to cover. I want to start with that, though. What do you make of the fact that the moves are very orderly this morning to something that feels like a step towards normalization? Um, I think in part, <clears throat> you know, if, if you look at the way people trade the yen, there are two groups of people. There are people who um, go along the yen because we've gone from 100 to 150, and hell's bells, in real terms, it hasn't been this cheap since the 1970s, and most people can't remember that. So, <laughs> right. um, and then there's another group who, every time volatility picks up, they sell it because nothing's going to happen, because the yield differential has driven everything, and the Bank of Japan's not tightening monetary policy. And, and in a sense, today didn't dissuade either group, so nobody's done anything. So, so we haven't had a spike in vol because in the end, the yield differential hasn't moved very much because 10-year note yields got up to 4%. So, um, so they both moved pretty much together for you know, to all intents and purposes. Um, they've, they've announced that they feel that they now have the right to let their yield curve control adjust so that they go outside of their band when they want. Wow, what's that? that's a nudge. That's not a shift, right? It's a, um, so it's not even a tweak in my kind of sense of the world. But, but so, so having done that, you kind of look and say, well, I go out of it thinking, you've, you've protected the upside in dollar yen. You've, you've, you know, mm -hmm. the yen can't fall much after this, but you haven't done the things that I need to do to get happy, to get dollar yen uh -huh. down towards 130 on, on its way. And so, you know, I kind of look and say, well, the danger is it's going to be slow. The, the positive a yen bull can take is, uh, you know, I think it's very clear that they don't want dollar yen moving higher than this, high, you know, back up to 145, yes. 150. So you can feel comfortable, but th that's kind of as good as it gets. But, but will we look back <clears throat> on this then and say, okay, this was actually a pretty elegant solution from the BOJ. If they're making, again, just small nudges, as you say, but they're moving in that direction without disrupting anything, without getting a spike in vol? Or are you saying it's just, it's not enough? It doesn't mean anything, it's a nudge. No, I, 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 think, I think it reflects the fact, and you can see it in the forecasts, they don't think they've beaten disinflation, they don't think they've got growth, you know, they, they have, they've moved up short-term inflation forecasts left along what long-term so, ones So is this not at. a step towards normalization then? As, as no, he said I, it I, wasn't. I, it, it isn't really, well, it, it's an indication that they know that, that yield curve control is a bad policy that needs to go. Um, and it's an indication that they're, you know, they're cognizant of the fact that actually the economy is doing better than it was relative to the rest of the world, and inflation is showing some signs of being sticky, whatever their forecasts say. But I think it can take, you know, it'll take months to get the next move. This is a bit like December in the sense we are, we are going to, this is going to really, really, really drive me nuts before they get there. <laughs> I think that's the message I, I, I take from it. I, 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 my, my only concern is that I think ultimately yield curve control is a terrible policy. It should be got rid of as soon as you think it's safe to do so because it's so distorting. You know, I would, I would get rid of yield curve control years before I tried to do serious quantitative tightening, for example. Mm. Um, so, I, so I'm frustrated because I think they're permanently hostage to fortune if the bond market starts running as well. They, I think they think today that, look, if we had, if 10-year notes went to 450 in the US tomorrow because mm. something happens, at least they've bought themselves the option not to buy infinite JGBs in right. response. Uh, a, a very Can crucial point. Yeah, I mean, a very crucial point, uh, 450 on the U.S. I mean, it feels like we're almost not even that far given the direction of travel overnight for the 10-year-old at 4%. But Kit, talk to us a little bit about what this does for hedging. We know that JGBs and, and the Japanese yen in particular are often used for macro trades in terms of, of the hedging process. 
How does that get reevaluated as a tool given perhaps these nudges from the BOJ? I think in a sense, it, you know, it, um, it gets reevaluated in the same way as the people who systematically sell any uptick in volatility and think ranges will hold in dollar yen, um, you know, feel a little bit, you know, uncertain about what to do. So as long as, as, long as volatility remains depressed, and, and I'd be surprised if it moves up very much now, um, then, uh, then, then you'll, you'll, I think you'll find that the, these traders will remain in place. You know, the, the carry trade still works for them in terms of the yield differentials well enough for, for everybody else, and it's okay. I think if you saw foreign exchange volatility in particular pick up um, more significantly from here, I think the carry trades run into problems at that point. And again, I'm very biased. I want yield curve control to be removed, and I'd like more foreign exchange volatility. So, um, I, you know, I don't always want to forecast what I think is what I want to happen. I, I think we're going to have to be patient. I think the carry traders know that they're earning carry today, and they'll keep on earning. They're going to earn lots of little bits, but that they're getting closer to the point where that game ends. A man who loves chaos, Kit, we love it. Uh, I, I want to ask a little bit about the BOJ's kind of roadmap building here. We know they're very, uh, they have a reputation for kind of building some controversial monetary policy, buying ETFs, for example, amid others. If they do eventually get out of this yield curve control dynamic elegantly, as Danny just put it, what kind of precedent does that set for monetary policy around the world for some of these other G10 banks? I think if they get out of it, people feel encouraged that you can. You know, we, we've had, I mean, from, you know, we had, we had the, you know, the first completely different spectacular, um, this time is different global financial crisis. And then we had whatever we want to call it, this time is different to pandemics and wars and, and energy crises and, and goodness knows what else. Uh, and, and central banks have been left with, you know, bloated balance sheets that they're not sure how to normalize, a range of sort of, fairly extraordinary policies put in place to deal with crisis. Uh, and as soon as anybody can start normalizing their policy, everybody else feels good. There is light at the end of my personal tunnel. But, uh, but you know, I, I think in the end that we're going to see central banks try to get out of these extraordinary policies and possibly promise never to do them again. Interesting. But that'll be in years. Yeah, interesting. Simply because, uh, I mean, this was exactly the narrative that we had for the Federal Reserve as well, right? That they couldn't engineer a soft landing. And then here we are. Potentially, it looks like that's exactly what's happening. Kit, if you're Chair Powell in sitting in Washington right now and you're watching what's going on with the BOJ, what are you thinking? I'm, um, I'm looking at it thinking they've managed to, to make a move that was calm without doing anything crazy, and, and that's helpful. But beyond that, I mean, I think if I'm Chair Powell, I permanently have my fingers crossed behind my back and hoping and praying that, um, that I can achieve, that I can avoid a recession um, despite hiking rates so fast, that my long and variable lags won't come to bite me in six months' time um, when, when uh, everybody's got themselves comfortable, that the labor market gen gently improves because labor force participation gets better. You know, he, he's relying on a ton of things going right for him. And so far, they sort of are. I just want to end on this kit because I, I have seen some criticism of Ueda after this decision um, from Bloomberg Economics, no less, so a colleague of mine, Taro Kimura, who says that the move tarnishes Ueda's reputation as a clear communicator. He'd been consistent in sending dovish signals, but his actions may now be perceived as unpredictable and even hawkish. I gotta say, the market isn't really interpreting it that way. I mean, I, I'm just curious what you make of that. I think it's fair to say the Bank of Japan are tinkerers in this, and he seems like a willing to tinker at the, the margin, yeah. sort of a football coach who changes his team every game and or, or formations twice in a game, you know, kind of can't leave it alone. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, I think to say that you're unpredictable, um, yeah, the, the market says he's pretty clear in his communications. Um, and, and they tend to do what they communicate. I mean, if you, if you forecast BOJ actions from what was in Japanese newspapers the day before BOJ meetings, you, you, you don't get it wrong much at the moment. Correct. This is, I mean, one level depressing, but unpredictable? I mean, uh, the market doesn't necessarily need the hand-holding, right? No, I, you know, that there is a case that says at some point, when, when you get to where you want to be, you, know, you, you can easily argue that central banks over-communicate dramatically. Um, I, I'll give them a pass on that because the Bank of Japan is trying to exit from, it's trying to exit the economy from a, 
multi-decade disinflation problem and monetary policy from a multi-year reaction to that. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. Kit, we could have you on for, for the next couple of hours. Perhaps next time we will. Sakchen's Kit Jukes all over those stories. Thank you, as always. Coming up, we go from the macro to the micro. Intel gaining after beating the street on revenue and guidance. We're going to dig deeper with William DeGale, lead portfolio manager over at Blue Box Asset Management. Uh, coming up next, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Intel reporting a surprising profit in the second quarter with a bullish sales forecast for the entire second half. Joining us now is William DeGale, lead tech portfolio manager over at Blue Box Asset Management. He spent 20 years covering the tech sector and is looking at some pretty good green on the screen right now when it comes to those Intel shares. William, thank you as always for joining us this morning. Let's start with, before we go into the nitty gritty of the earnings story, this broad question of AI. It feels like not only has it powered a lot of the stock market moves, but there's a real enthusiasm into it from a corporate piece as well. At what point, though, can all of that excitement actually be managed by the capacity to execute? Are you are you thinking about that in, in that kind of way? Well, I think there is some displacement going on. So you're you're seeing signs. For example, I think it was Juniper reported that it's seeing some reduction in its business because data center spend is being concentrated more on AI than, than everything else. Um, so there is some displacement going on. Uh, there clearly is an enormous amount of money being poured into generative AI. I think because investors sort of expect managements to do it, so managements are doing it, um, presumably tentatively at the moment, but that is having immediate effects. You know, I think what's so interesting about the AI story is that, sure, AI sounds great, even EVs sound great, but it all requires massive uh, chip capacity, which it doesn't feel like has really grown that much in the last couple of years. Will, let's talk, William, excuse me, let's go back into uh, the nitty gritty of the Intel story. It feels like just a couple of days ago, we heard from Samsung that they weren't able to capitalize on the AI story. Why is Intel different? Well, I think AI's boost, uh, sorry, Intel's boost hasn't been so much from the AI on this, that the, the beat seems to have come more from the PC business. Um, uh, they saw upside from the data center business, but not as dramatic. And I think their guidance for the second half, the impression I get there is it isn't, that they're not saying that gets a heck of a lot stronger at this point. So at, at the moment, it's mainly the traditional Intel business, which has been stronger than expected. And that's enough to push them into profit from an expected loss. When you're thinking about this supply chain, especially if you want to get on to that AI train, William, where do you want to be positioned? Are the, is it the chip makers? Is it people making the equipment for the chip makers? Do you go to the other side and go to the software providers? Yeah, so, so my favorite area would be to go to the chip equipment makers. Um, there are some, if you pick the chip makers, you probably get substantial upside at the moment. NVIDIA, no problem. We've got positions there and, and monolithic and so on. But in the end, whatever happens in technology depends on semiconductors. And whatever, where, whoever builds the semiconductors, in the end, they're built on machinery that's provided by essentially four companies. So you, 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 catch, you, you catch the upside for tech with the equipment companies, whatever happens. And they're very, very attractive businesses um, because they've got extremely strong long-term growth trends as a result. And also, they're quite volatile, and people are frightened of them as a result. Uh, but if you're confident in the trend, um, then you can play, you know, you can trade against that volatility. So, you, so you get uh, upside from that as well. So, it's, so they're really very attractive businesses from my point of view. G give me some specific names here, William. Who there do you like? You mentioned four. Where, are the, what are the standouts? Yeah. So, so the f the four big companies are ASML, um, which has a monopoly in uh, lithography, advanced lithography, and then you've got uh, Tokyo Electrical Applied Materials and LAM Research, and basically, those four companies make pretty much everyone, everything uh, in terms of the production equipment. There are other companies out there. So ASM International, for example, is a smaller player in a, in a similar space. But those four catch the vast majority. Of those, my favorite personally is LAM Research. Uh, and, and I like it the most because of exactly the reason everybody else hates it, which is it's the most exposed to the memory market. Now, the memory semiconductors, this is uh, NAND and DRAM, um, yeah, that's not a great industry to be in. It's extremely capital intensive, um, very cyclical, and it doesn't really create a huge amount of, of value for end investors. So people quite rightly don't like the memory market. 
So therefore, they don't like land research either because it's the biggest supplier to the memory market. 60 to 70 percent of its revenue comes from there. But that's exactly what you should like it because what you're saying here is that land research is the biggest supplier of capital equipment to the most capital intensive industry in the world. And that's a, that's a fantastic place to be. And, and this company has, I think, seen something like 600 percent revenue growth since before the financial crisis of so the last 15 fiscal years, got a June year end. Um, and the stock's up by a factor of about 20 times over that period. And, and it's still trading at 20, less than 20 times next year's earnings. It typically trades in the, in the low teens because everyone just doesn't like this memory exposure. But this is the company that's extracting all the value from the memory industry. The memory companies are spending huge amounts and more than a fair share is going to land research. So that's, that's in my view, why you should like it. It's a fascinating sector for sure, especially at a time when you also have to price in the likes of what does interference from the U.S., the Dutch, and even the mm. Japanese uh, governments have to do. William DeGale, too short of time, but we appreciate you always joining the show. Blue Box Asset Management's lead tech portfolio manager later uh, there with us today. Later today, of course, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger will also be joining Bloomberg Technology. That comes up at 12 p.m. New York time, 9 a.m. in San Francisco, 5 p.m in London. Coming up, a look at some of the market moving events to watch throughout the day. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Now let's take a look at what's ahead on your Friday. Chevron and Exxon both reporting earnings before the U.S. market open. And then we're going to get the latest read on German inflation. That will be at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Then the really interesting one that could yet again cause some volatility in yields. It's PCE deflator and personal income and spending. The Fed's favorite gauge of inflation comes out in the U.S. at 8.30 a.m. Then we're going to have you, Mitch, sentiment survey. That will hit at 10 a.m. Pretty. Yeah, a lot to digest on the macro front. Just as we're getting through a central bank palooza, a lot of eco data to digest as well. Well, on the micro front, a lot moving as well, specifically to the upside, Danny. Intel surprising investors in a really big way. Remember we were talking about that PC slump, that massive memory chip slump? Well, look, Intel is saying that's not really a thing anymore. Intel shares higher by about 7% this morning, and with it, taking AMD higher by 2.5% as well. So some green on the screen for the chip makers. I want to get to another tech name here, Roku, getting a lot of attention this morning as well. Their revenue blowing past uh, expectations, specifically when it co comes to those streaming names. And remember, they're also saying this is a great quarter, but what we are worried about is those Hollywood strikes really prolonging to something bigger, higher by about 9.4%. And lastly, let's go to those car makers because that is crucial. You're seeing Ford come down to the downside despite the likes of Tesla really getting in on that EV trade down about 2% saying, look, that EV scaling that we were going to do, maybe we're going to have to pull back a lot of that because of the pricing war you're dealing with the other tech uh, car makers. Pretty. I also wanted to bring us an update on that car carrying ship in the Netherlands that is on been on fire. We're, of course, hoping for everybody's safety around there. The ship has been on fire since late Wednesday. Latest reports, it still is indeed on fire. However, this is the update. Almost 500 electric cars are on this ship. Previously, there were suggestions it was just 25. The question has been, is it an EV that started this fire? It seems more likely given that number. It's something that will potentially play into the image of these EVs. All right, that's it for Early Edition on this Friday. Surveillance is up next. They'll be speaking to UBS's chief U.S. economist, Jonathan Pingle. This is Bloomberg.